So we're picking up with Dunn's Meditation 17 on 941. Uh, we're going to pick up in the left-hand column with... I'm going to back up a little bit to where we left off. Uh, with the sentence that begins, if we understand or write. If we understand or write the dignity, of, the dignity of this bell that tolls for our evening prayer, we would be glad to make it ours by rising early in that application, that it might be ours as well as his, whose indeed it is. Now, notice what he's saying there, you know, in that application, that is, that we would apply the tolling of this bell to our lives. Okay? He says if we take it to just mean that the bell is telling us to get to church for evening prayer, we would do well to apply it to our lives to make our rising early. And by that he means rising in two senses. He means physically rising, getting up early enough to make sure that we're not late for church, but he also means it in a spiritual sense, a spiritual resurrection, a death and rebirth, okay? So that we won't be late for our death, so to speak. <coughs> that it might be ours as well as his, the person for whom the bell is tolling. The bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth. Okay? So, Doug is telling us, whenever anyone hears the bell tolling, and not just a regular tolling, you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever hour, but the death toll, he says, if you hear that bell and you think it tolls for you, then it does toll for you. Apply it to yourself. And though it intermit again, that is, and though it stops tolling and you don't physically die, You've done what? You've applied the tolling of the bell, you've heard the tolling of the bell, and you are reminded of your own death. In other words, it serves as a memento mori. Reminder of death. Okay? You'll often see in, in Renaissance portraiture, the you know, other guy sitting, you know, dressed in fine clothes and everything. And somewhere in the portrait, I think there's a couple in your in your book. Somewhere in the court in the portrait is a skull. Sometimes I'll have his hand, or she'll have her hand resting on the skull, or the skull will be in the background, partially observable. But the skull is there as this. It's a reminder of death. It's a reminder that. All things die and get ready, get prepared. Okay? So, the bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth, and though it intermit again, it pauses. Okay? Yet from that minute that that occasion wrought upon him, from the moment he heard the bell and applied it to his own life. Ah, this bell is a reminder that I too will die. What am I going to prepare? How am I going to prepare for death? Okay. He is united to God. Dunn's not presupposing an atheist, for example. He's presupposing that the bell will make one think, I better get ready. I better prepare for death. Okay. Who casts not up his eye to the sun when it rises? So he leaves the bell imagery and gives us to another one. Or it leads us to the sun rising. But who takes off his eye from a comet when that breaks out? That is, how can you, if a comet suddenly appears in the night sky, how can you suddenly turn away from that to something else? Who bends not his ear to any bell which upon any occasion rings? Who, if you hear something ring, a bell, doesn't immediately take note of it? But who can remove it? Who can stop the ear from hearing that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world? A piece of himself. And that's when he says, no man is an island entire of itself. No one is
independent. In not dependent. What does dependent mean? D out of or away from hanging. Dependent means self existent. Okay? Independent means not self existent. No one done a saying is this. No one is an island, right? Like the Hawaiian Islands. They don't depend on the North American continent or the South American continent or the continent of Asia or the continent of Africa or the continent of Antarctica, right? They're totally separate from. Dunn is saying no man is like that. Everyone is, in other words, connected. No man is an island, is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent. The continent, we could say, is human nature. We all share in this. Right? Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clog be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. As well as if a promontory, a clod, a, a, you know, a clump of sand, if it gets washed into the sea, he says, Europe is smaller just as much as if a promontory, a big piece of land, if that were washed into the sea. The only difference is size. Still, Europe, the main land, is now reduced. Humanity, done is saying, is now reduced. Whether one person dies or a thousand persons die. As well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. A manner, a house. Okay. Any man's death diminishes me. Why? Because I am involved in mankind. That is, involved. I'm connected. I'm linked. We're all, the speaker is saying, interconnected. We all depend on one another. We like to think we're independent, especially Americans. Really like to think we're independent. And yet we're not. Because if that power suddenly went off, if these lights suddenly went out, I could put, no, I can't because I just gave it away. I could put money on this desk that would say at least one of you would start packing everything up and be ready to go. Because it's dark, can't you're dependent on somebody making sure that power still flows. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never sin to know for whom the bells tolls. Notice he doesn't say ask not for whom the bell tolls, which is what the common saying is. Never sin to know for whom the bells tolls, it tolls for the, if a person dies, part of me, done is saying, dies with that person. I am the less because of that person's death. How many of you have read A Christmas Carol by Dickens? How many of you have seen A Christmas Carol or Scrooge or some kind of version of it? Okay. What's the important scene in there that I think Dickens kind of lifted from Dunn? Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by his partner who's been dead for seven years, Jacob Marley. And Scrooge tells him, you were always a good businessman. Anybody know what Jacob Marley replies with? 
Remember, Jacob Marley is bound up with chains and lockboxes. Okay? And he tells Scrooge, they were forged through his long years in life. And now he's condemned to wear them for eternity. Why? Because when Scrooge says, you were always a good businessman, he says, mankind was my business. That is, every one of these links was because I didn't pay attention to this person, this person, this person, this person, etc., etc. Ask not, never sent to know for whom the bells tolls, it tolls for thee. So when you hear that death knell, Dunn is speaking to his audience, his contemporaneous audience, 1624. Don't ask who's died. Look in the mirror and think, how am I dying? Neither can we call this, that is, applying the tolling of the bell to my own existence, a begging of misery or a borrowing of misery. In other words, you know, come on, Dunn, don't be morbid. Don't be melodramatic. As though we were not miserable enough of ourselves, but must fetch in more from the next house and taking upon us the misery of our neighbors. He says, it's not a seeking for more misery by saying, my life's not so bad, so I'm going to borrow misery, death from somebody else, to kind of make myself morbidly think about my mortality and such. He says, no. No man hath affliction enough that is not matured and ripened by it and made fit for God by that affliction. What does he mean? No one has enough affliction who is not matured and ripened by it. Affliction brings what, he's suggesting. Maturity, ripening. Why that? Why that use of ripening? A ripe fruit is one. What? It's ready to be, to be consumed. It's it's done, so to speak. Okay. Affliction does what? It duns us. It makes us ready for our finality for the reason for which we exist and made fit for God by that affliction. Fit. What does fit mean? Ready, prepared for God. Like God is the divine consumer and God will be the thing that will consume our ripened fruit. We will be made ready for God, he says, by affliction. Pain, agony, sorrow, distress, illness, disease, warfare. You know, list all the troubling things that we've read everything this semester. He says, those do what? They prepare us for God. How? You're a reminder of death. Truly, it were an excusable covetousness if we did. That is, if we were borrowing this misery from our neighbors, he says, that would be excusable. Notice, it would be an excusable covetousness. Covetousness is a sin. It's mentioned in the Ten Commandments. He says, it would be excusable. For affliction is a treasure, and scarce any man hath enough of it. Juxtapose that with a, you know, with our 21st century American mentality, which says, flee all affliction by all costs. Suffering is bad, period, whether it's little suffering or great suffering. How do you know? Look at the pharmaceutical industry. Look at the uh, cosmetics industry. They're both designed for what purpose? To relieve suffering. The suffering might be, I don't like how I look, 
or the suffering might be, my finger hurts, take a pill. <laughs> or I've got a, some other kind of pain, take something for it. Remove the pain, because pain is inherently bad. Done is saying, no, it's not. Pain is inherently good. Okay? No man hath affliction enough that is not mature to ripen by it, and made fit for God by that affliction. If a man can if a man carry treasure in bullion or in a wedge of gold, and have none coined into current money, his treasure will not defray him as he travels. If you didn't have a credit card in your wallet or purse or cash and your car was on empty and all you had was, let's say, a bar of gold like this size and you went to a gas station, what good would that bar of gold do you? None. Because you couldn't put it into the slot for the gas tank, for the gas pump. That's what he means. He says, tribulation, pain, agony, suffering, is treasure. It's like bullion in the nature of it. It's that bar of gold, right? In and of itself, it's useless. But it is not current money in the use of it. That's why I said it's useless, right? Except we get nearer and nearer our home, heaven, by it. So heaven is the home for done. And he's saying tribulation, affliction, pain, agony, suffering does what? It becomes more and more useful the more and more it's used to bring us closer to heaven. Another man may be sick too, and sick to death, that is, and die. And this affliction may lie in his bowels as gold in a mine, and be of no use to him. Why? What does he do with that affliction? What does he do with that gold, that affliction, let's say, in his bowels? See, his stomach cancer, literally in his bowels, right? If he doesn't use it, if he doesn't convert that affliction, that gold in his bowels to currency, to something to be used, then it will do what? What does cancer do? It eats you. It'll eat him away. That's why he says, it may lie in his bowels as gold in a mine and be of no use to him. But this bell, boom, boom, tells me of his affliction. It tells because it is telling. You know, the reason you call a bank teller a bank teller is because what does the bank teller do? Counts out the money. Tell and toll. They're the same words. You know, when you go through a, a toll booth on a parkway or a road that has a toll on it, you got to throw money in it. The same thing. He says, this bell that tells me of his affliction because it's tolling, does what? It digs out and applies that gold, the gold that is eating him away. It applies it to me, Dunn says. Here's how. If, by this consideration of another's danger, I take mine own into contemplation. If I think this person is dying, and I then make myself think I am dying too. If I'm reminded of this. You know, I kind of think this is what Hamlet, the play, is entirely about. You get to the scene in Act 5, scene 1, where Hamlet's meeting with Horatio, his friend, and they're getting ready, Hamlet's getting ready to have a fencing match with another man named Laertes. 
Hamlet has killed Laertes' father. Laertes wants revenge. All right? And Hamlet, he's got a bad feeling in his gut about this. His friend Horatio says, don't, don't, get, don't engage. Don't go to the fencing match. It's not a fight to the death. It's a match, like a game. He says, don't do it. Hamlet says, nah. If it be not now, it'll be later. If it be not later, it'll be now. Essentially says, you know, the readiness is all. The readiness for what? For death. If it's today, it's today. If it's tomorrow, it's tomorrow. I have to be as ready for death now as I do if I'm going to die when I'm 85. And what Hamlet is saying there, and what Dunn is saying here, is that every day one should remember this. Every moment of every day one should remember this. Okay? If I take mine own into contemplation and so secure myself by making my recourse to my God, who is our only security, and that takes us back to the end of the wanderer. You want real security, the wanderer says? You want real stability? Don't seek it down here. Because everything down here is changeable. Everything down here is impermanent. Okay? Seek it in heaven instead. Go from there, so we're done with done, to, uh, I don't know why I put Herbert first, because he comes after all these others. Um, to George Herbert. Easter Wings is on 963. Just a little bit of background about Herbert. Um, Herbert's a contemporary of Dunn's. A bit younger, about 20 years younger. Not, uh, yeah, 1593, I think, is when he was born. Yeah, so he's 21 years younger than Dunn. He was a follower of Dunn's, um, Dunn was good friends with his mother. He wrote poems to and for Herbert's mother. Herbert was different than <coughs> Dunn or any of the other poems, uh, poets that we're going to read, you know, during the, the 17th century period, um, in that Herbert wrote only devotional poetry. Dunn wrote devotional poetry. Devotional meaning religious. You know, if you if we had read the Holy Sonnets, those are all devotional poems. Okay, "Hymn to God the Father" is another devotional poem. I'm trying to remember what else we read by Dunn. We didn't read any other of um, Good Friday, sixteen writing Western, sixteen thirteen writing writing Western. That's a devotional poem. All right, Herbert only wrote this. See, Dunn also wrote his. Erotic poems. He also wrote his love sonnets and such. Okay, uh, we're going to see, you know, with um, Robert Herrick, he writes devotional poetry. He writes secular poetry. Uh, Marvell writes devotional poetry. Writes secular poetry. Herbert's the only one who writes only devotional poetry, and it's all collected in one book called The Temple. In The Temple has kind of this overarching metaphor. The poem, or excuse me, the book of poetry is constructed like the edifice of a temple. You have the porch steps that lead up to the porch. You have the porch outside the church. <clears throat> you go inside the church, and you have the general area where all the people sit and or stand, and then you go back, and there's the altar area, and then there's the altar. And so, it's kind of this metaphorical, you go into this big, you know, kind of church, all right? So we're only going to do a couple. How many? We're going to do three poems by Herbert. The first one is Easter Wings on page 963. <clears throat> and this is variously called a shape poem or a picture poem, all right? And that's because how it appears on the page is in the shape of what the poem is talking about. 
If you turn for a moment to page 962, the first poem on that page, The Altar, is the same kind of thing. The poem is written on the page so that it looks like a physical altar. Kind of looks, you know, like this podium. Okay? So, I'm going to turn your book to read this correctly. And you have a facsimile of the poem as it appears in the first printing of the book, The Temple. Lord who created man in wealth and store, though foolishly he lost the same, decaying more and more till he became most poor, with thee, oh, let me rise as lurks harmoniously and sing this day thy victorize. Then shall the fall further the flight in me. Notice it's Easter wings. I've got a gloss. Um... Yeah, and don't need to talk about the gloss. So no, look what happens in that first stanza. Lord, who created man in wealth and store. It's the longest line in that first stanza. So greatest wealth. Store means like storehouse. Um, place where you store stuff. It's full, right? Though foolishly he lost the same. The line gets smaller. There are fewer syllables. So the store and the wealth is diminishing, decaying more and more, it gets smaller, till he became, four syllables, most poor. And it's most poor, the smallest amount of syllables, okay, then gets repeated. Not verbally repeated, but the number of syllables. With thee, oh, let me rise, till he became, oh, let me rise, four syllables. So the thing starts off large, it gets small, and then it gets large again. Why? It's like the beam of the wings. The wings are up here, they're large, they come back down close to the body, and they come out and get large again. With thee, oh, let me arise as larks harmoniously. Larks sing in the morning, the rising of the sun. And sing this day, what day is it? It's Easter. Sing this day thy victories, conquering death. Then shall the fall further the flight in me. What fall? Now the speaker is probably referring to Adam and Eve's fall, the fall in the Garden of Eden, and the individual's fall. What's the falling? They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Wealth in store, full life, became most poor, death, and then rising again. Okay? The fall, death, shall further the flight in me as the soul rises, you know, flies to heaven. My tender age in sorrow did begin. And still with sicknesses and shame, thou didst so punish sin, that I became most thin. With thee let me combine, and feel this day thy victory. Excuse me, thy victory. For if I imp my wing on thine, affliction shall advance the flight in me. Why did the speaker's tender age begin in sorrow? Think back to the wife of Bath's tale. Answer now, the great knight. Original sin. He's Anglican. Okay. Herbert is. He believes in the doctrine of original sin. That... Everyone is born in a state of sin. Okay? That's why my tender age, my youngest age, began in sorrow. But, and still with sicknesses and shame, thou didst so punish sin. So, sickness 
is a punishment. Shame is a punishment. That I became most thin. What's most thin? Air to gold to airy thinness be, where you can't see anything. That's death. Okay. With thee, let me combine. And there's probably an allusion there to the traditional Christian idea of the Eucharist and communion. That you know, taking the communion meal, the bread and wine of Christ, you are taking Christ into you, you're combining with okay, Christ. With thee let me combine and feel this day, again it's Easter, thy victory. For if I imp my wing on mine, and God gloss, imping a wing is referring to taking a bird and stuffing additional feathers into that wing of a bird. It gives it more lift. He's saying, let me kind of get stuffed onto your wings. Let me be engrafted to you. Why? Because if I do that, then affliction shall advance the flight in me. And we're back to the end of Meditation 17. Affliction, notice, is what? It's punishment from God. And affliction will do it. If I unite myself to you, to Christ's victory, then affliction will bring me closer to God. Go from there to the collar. 971. I struck the board and cried, no more I will abroad. Is that how that line should be read? Or those two lines should be read? No. I struck the board means what? <laughs> room and board means you get a room and you get a table of food. I struck the board. I hit that table hard. Why? I'm out of here. That's what I'm I will abroad means. I'm out of here. I'm done. I've had it. Enough. What? See, between I will abroad and what, it's almost like if the speaker is addressing somebody, the person being addressed did something to catch the speaker's attention. I will abroad. You know, heads toward that door. And this person kind of goes, what? What? Shall I ever, always, sigh and pine? My lines in life are free, free as the road, loose as the wind, as large as store. In other words, nothing is holding me back. This is not like Frost's speaker in Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, where the speaker says, I have miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. You know, the speaker wants to fall asleep in the woods on a snowy evening. He wants to commit suicide, but doesn't. Why? I've got responsibilities. I've got things to do before I can sleep. This speaker is saying, I don't have any responsibilities. I don't have anybody who depends on me. My lines and life are free. Lines is probably referring to mooring lines. The kind of lines, you know, you throw it from a boat onto the pier and somebody, you know, wraps it around the thing on the dock. Shall I be still in suit? Your gloss tells you in suit means in attendance. Shall I always be waiting on somebody? Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me bleed? And not restore what I have lost with cordial fruit. Cordial fruit. It's like liquor, alcohol. Sure, there was wine before my size did dry it. Okay? Petrarchan conceit. There was corn before my tears did dry it. Is the year only lost to me? 
That's implying the person has been in suit, waiting, in attendance for a year. Okay? I'm done. I'm out of here. That's why. Been waiting for a year. Have I no bays, laurel wreaths, no signs of victory to crown it? To crown what? To crown the year. To mark as this year is complete and I won. I did something, you know, I've, I've got a, you know, something to check off my bucket list, so to speak. No flowers, no garlands gay, all blasted. All wasted? Have I blown the entire year? I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people who feel like the last year and a half, just, you know, they're an interregnum. They're an in-between year for the rest of their lives. Hopefully it's only a year and a half. Not so my heart. That is, the person's heart is thinking this. Have I wasted the entire year not so my heart but there is fruit and thou hast hands gloss an echo of the disobedience that led to the original fall lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life what's the speaker saying I haven't given in to temptation this entire past year. I haven't followed my heart this entire past year. And now the speaker says, oh, look, there's fruit. And I have hands. I can pick that fruit. Recover all thy sigh blown age on double pleasures. How do you get double pleasures? What does it mean? Recover all thy side blown age. Try to cram into the next year two years of pleasure. You know, there, you always hear stories, whether they're real or not. I know of at least one that is real. You hear, you know, urban myths about somebody finds out go to the doctor, have their annual whatever, and they get a letter in the mail, you've got inoperable cancer. And the person says, ah, the hell with it. And they get out, apply for a whole bunch of credit cards, max them all out, do a round the world trip, blah, 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 and then find out, oops, lab mix up. It wasn't me. There was an actual case of that about five years ago. There's a guy from Australia. And it was literally, oops, Wrong person's results were sent. And he took out like $150,000 in credit cards. Who did a round the world tour, got back home, letter from his doctor, oops, was it you? You know, and he sued. Sued the doctor, sued the lab, you know, but he was still responsible for the credit card debt. That's what the speaker is saying. You denied yourself these pleasures for a year. Now, Double up. Get as much pleasure as you can, as fast as you can. Leave thy cold dispute of what is fit and not. What does that mean? What is fit and not? What's right and what's not right? It's a cold dispute. Why? Because it occurs up here in the mind. It's logic. And it's a dispute. Because there's an argument. There's an argument for and against. One argument says, hey, you only live once. Go for the gusto. Grab that brass ring. Take everything you can. It's the bumper, the sticker that says, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is, you know, kind of Dunn's argument in the meditation. Or the argument, you know, uh, we saw in Easter wings, okay? It's a cold dispute of what is fit and not, what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate. Forsake thy cage. You know, my Angelus, I know why the caged bird sings. 
Get rid of the cage. But what's the cage made of? Thy rope of sins. How good a rope is sand? It's not. So how can it be rope? Which petty thoughts have made. Petty thoughts. What's petty cash? It's, you know, if you keep a drawer, or you have a drawer, and you put change into that drawer, or you get ones back, and you put them in there, that's a petty cash drawer. You know, like our department secretary has a petty cash drawer for buying flowers or, you know, if somebody needs a quick, you know, a student needs money, every now and then you can go and get some, etc. That's what that is. But petty thoughts are small thoughts, little thoughts. Notice the rope of sands is made by petty thoughts, small, little thoughts, and made to the good cable. To enforce and draw. What's good cable? Notice it's not good rope. Cable refers to the big thick ropes that are used to tie boats and ships up in a dock. So I've seen some of these. Some of these are that big in diameter, six feet in diameter. These are big, massive ropes. Notice the petty thoughts have made the rope of sands into good cable. What is holding this person back? His or her own thoughts. And they made good cable to enforce and draw and be thy law. While thou didst wink and wouldst not see. Your gloss, wink, shut one's eyes. Yeah, that could be what it means. It could also mean blink. Like, ooh, there's temptation. Don't look at it. Well, get the idea? Wants to look, doesn't want to look. Wants to look, doesn't want to look. Away! Take heed. Go now. I will abroad. Call in thy, you know, I had memento mori up here. Thy death head there. Put away the skull. This isn't some goth thing. This is a real skull. It's to be a reminder. It's why in Hamlet, you know, at the beginning of Act 5, there's a grave digger scene. And they're throwing up, digging up skeletons. So that Hamlet can go on this big long riff about this is what happens to everybody. Kings as well as paupers. Come, put it away. Tie up thy fears. Bind your fears and do what with them. Doesn't say necessarily do what with them. Tie them up, hide them. Don't pay any attention to them. He that forbears to suit and serve his need deserves his load. If you, the speaker is saying, don't go for what you want out of this life, then you get, or you deserve, what you get out of this life. If you're more than willing to settle for middle of the road, boring, middle class existence, then that's what you're going to get. But if you want more, what do you have to do? you got to scrabble and claw for it. But as I notice the verb, raved. What does it mean to rave? What kind of person raves? It means you're not in your right mind. Only crazy people rave. Usually another verb that goes along with Rave and rant. Right? As I raved and grew more fierce and wild at every word, methought I heard one calling. I mean, James Earl Jones, child. And I replied, My Lord. That's 
the rope of sands. Methought I heard. There's the disputation. There's the cold dispute. Speaker wants to go do this. And the conscience says no. Okay. Notice, as I've raved at every word, child, my lord. Why is the title the caller? C-O-L-L-A-R? Because doesn't that last two lines, doesn't that imply C-A-L-L, one L, or two L's, E-R? Could, what else could it be? Heal. Child. Arr. Sorry, Lord. It implies both. Bear in mind, George Herbert is a priest, an Anglican priest. Anglican priests wear, just like Catholic priests do, collars. Okay? Ten minutes. And one more? Yes, one more. The pulley. Now you might think, a pulley? How can a pulley be a devotional poem? I mean, you put a rope around it, you pull down one side, it lifts something up. You pull down the other side, it lifts something up on the other side. When God had first made man, having a glass of blessing standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches, which dispersing lie, contract into a span. So, back Garden of Eden. God has a glass of blessings, Dasani water, not really, it's tap. Standing by, he says, let us, said he, notice, doctrinally correct, let us, Trinity, said he, God, pour on man all the world's riches, which dispersed lie, they're, they're all throughout the world. And let's contract all those into a span. All right? So strength first made a way. So that implies in this glass, strength is at the top. Then beauty flowed, then wisdom, honor, pleasure. When almost all was out, God made a stay. That is, God's sitting there pouring, and he realizes, I'm going to empty this, and stops. Perceiving that alone of all his treasure, rest in the bottom leg. Notice the pun. Rest, like um, cessation of activity, like calm, contentedness, peace, sleep, possibly even. Okay? But what else? Rest, the rest that is in the bottle, lay there. Okay? For if I should, said he, bestow this jewel, what's the jewel? Rest. In the Old Testament, Sabaoth, or Sabbath, is what it means, rest. Okay. If I should, said he, bestow this jewel also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me. What are the gifts? Strength, beauty, wisdom, honor, pleasure, etc. And rest in nature, that is, the things he was created from, not the God of nature, not the God that created the things he was made from. So both should losers be. Man would be a loser. Why? Because he wouldn't search for God. God would be a loser. Why? Because man wouldn't search for him. But let him keep the rest. That is everything else I've already poured into him. Strength, beauty, wisdom, honor, pleasure. Those are the ones named. Let him keep the rest and keep them with repining restlessness. Repining. Your gloss tells you fretful. How many people do you know use the word fretful? Yeah, none. What's it mean? Complaining, restlessness, dissatisfied, restlessness, discontent, restlessness. I still haven't found what I'm searching for. You too, Bono. Restlessness, that's what's meant. 
That's what's meant. Let him keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and weary. Rich. That is, in all these blessings I've given them, and it's not enough. That at least, if goodness lead him not, yet weariness may toss him to my breast. Weariness, I'm so freaking tired of life, of everything, of pain, of agony, of sorrow, of injustice, of poverty, of war, of hatred, racism, of prison. Maybe that will throw him to my breast. Why? To seek what is the opposite of all those. This poem, I think, is very heavily based on, could be entirely wrong, St. Augustine's Confessions. St. Augustine, the same guy who came up with the idea of original sin, St. Augustine talked about, in the Confessions, how he became Christian. And it's because he spent a lot of his early life just living for fun. If he had had sex, drugs, and rock and roll back in the first century, he, or third century, he'd been after sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Well, he was after sex and drink. Had a lot of girlfriends, etc. Okay, But he says every pleasure he went after, he realized after he became a Christian, he was trying to fill a hole in his chest, in his heart, what he literally says. And that hole was a God-shaped hole. It could only be filled with God. And he tried to fill it with what? He literally tried to fill it with sex, and drink, and pleasure, and happiness. And he says, it was only when I found the right piece to the puzzle that he found rest, completeness, wholeness, the whole nine yards. Okay? All right, we will stop there. It's 10.02. Uh, last day, we've only got two poems, but they will take us probably the full time. And those two poems are the two greatest. Let me just throw this out there. Carpe diem poems in the English language. Seize the day is what that means. Okay? All right, I'll stop there. Um, I will probably, I'm going to try to have the exam up today, tomorrow at the latest. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to do a quiz over the um, stuff after Shakespeare. It, it, it pretty much just be identify this, identify that kind of a thing. Um, probably won't because we've had quite a few quizzes.